of operations for the Association of State Correctional Administrators, ASCA. In that role, he traveled the country promoting the profession of corrections, supporting ASCA members in the implementation of evidence-based practices, and influenced national policies and practices affecting public safety. And Josh says that through his work with ASCA, he gained an even deeper appreciation for Idaho's correctional professionals, who says are among the nation's best. Prior to joining ASCA, Josh served for four years as Deputy Chief of the Division of Prisons and two years as Administrator of Budget and Policy. In these roles, he helped secure funding for a pay progression plan for uniformed corrections staff. He also is responsible for strategic, strategic initiatives, including shaping a department reorganization to better position the agency to meet future demands. As Director, Josh oversees the entirety of IDOC's operations, including its nine prisons, five community reentry centers, seven probation and parole districts. The department has an annual budget of $313 million as of uh, fiscal year 2022, and employs nearly 2,000 correctional professionals. They're responsible for the incarceration and community supervision of 25,000 people convicted of felonies. But also, uh, He's an Idaho native, a rancher, a former executive vice president of the Idaho Cattle Association, served on the staff of two Idaho governors and a U.S. congressman, um, as well as operating a small livestock operation in Meridian. Thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us, Josh. Thank you. And yeah, it, it's a little bit interesting. Normally I get asked, you know, uh, very, very specific questions about you know, this current event or this thing that's happening over here and very seldom do I get asked what it is I do and so it's a little embarrassing to say I don't have a clue most of the time uh, because no day is the same and you know, I, I, um, I, I think it's just an incredible honor to be a part of the Idaho Department of Correction and, and you look at you know, the footprint of the agency, you know, not just the, the nine state operated prisons or the community reentry centers or the probation and parole districts that, that stretch across the state, you know, we impact a lot of people's lives. And, you know, that impact can be positive, uh, but it can also be negative. And so, you know, it's a great honor, but also a, a tremendous responsibility to be associated with the agency. And so most of, you know, most of, of my work as, as director, um, you know, Chad Page, my chief of prisons is here, and he would tell you that, you know, a lot of it is signing autographs, uh, kissing babies and the like. Um, but, you know, from a practical standpoint, uh, you know, I answer to a board of correction that's appointed by the governor, and, and we really have, you know, they've tasked me with three pretty important things. And the first is to, to set the overall direction for the agency. Um, and, and we've been doing that for a while and, and really happy with that direction. Uh, the second thing is to make sure we got the right people in the right chairs uh, to help us move forward with that. And the third aspect is to measure it and make sure that we're making steady progress uh, on, that, on that march towards achieving that vision for public safety in Idaho. And so th those are the three big things and, and it, you know, there's a lot of uh, work that's internal to the agency of you know really trying to make sure that <clears throat> that people are positioned in the best possible manner to be successful at what we ask them to do and and then there's also the external component where it's working with legislators policymakers uh, community members trying to you know help help them understand where we fit in that picture but also where we need some help and where we can can use some assistance in ultimately helping the people who've been involved with our system or who may become involved with our system be successful in our communities where it really matters thank you so much how many autographs uh, I mean, so like far it's been two. Uh, oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, bo those were both summons, though, so I'm not sure <laughs> if it if it counts. Well, I will. Um, I know you know it's going to kind of um, tie into to what you told us already, but I'd love to to you know ask you what sent you on this career path. You know, how did you decide to pursue a career in corrections? 
Yeah, it, it, it was not it was not in the cards. It just wasn't a, a career that, that I had ever given any significant amount of thought to. Um, you know, you, on, on the bio, you read, I, you know, kind of grew up in politics and policy. And so I, I, I uh, worked for a couple different governors, worked for a member of Congress. I was, I, I loved the policy aspects of, of, you know, trying to affect public policy. Um, and it wasn't until I came back to work for um, uh, Governor Butch Otter that you know I looked to change portfolios. Pr prior to that, I'd done a lot of work given my background in ag and natural resources policy, and so um, he had asked if I would be interested in coming back to the office, and I said, "Yeah, but I'd kind of be interested in something new." And uh, and so I, I just by happenstance ended up with the public safety portfolio, and almost immediately. Uh, at the expense of everything else I was supposed to be taken care of, fell in love with corrections. Um, it was, I just never encountered, you know, there, there, I don't mean this in a, in a pejorative way, but, it, you know, it was the first time I had encountered work where, you know, the gravity and the significance of the impact, like you could feel it and you could just see how hard they were working, but how important that work was. Uh, and so I, I'd worked uh, with and around the agency for several years uh, and then was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to join the agency in 2011. So it, it, was, it was, wasn't something I had ever considered, but once I was exposed to it, you know, I don't have, uh, I don't have very many regrets in my career because, you know, you just feel like, oh, you're, you know, uh, experiences lead to certain things, but if I had to pick one, it was that I didn't find correction sooner because I, I, the work's fascinating, but the people are even better. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a common theme we've we've heard from folks who've uh, from folks who work with you that um, you know it's uh, it's the people that make make the entire difference, right? And so um, we're happy to get to to get to know you guys mm -hmm. now um how how um it's uh probably a super simplistic way to ask that question but uh you know how difficult have the past couple years been with the covid pandemic and um you know how how have programs been impacted and and yeah how do you feel uh or uh, like do you feel like uh you know an end is inside, or that, or do you feel like, you know, in your guys' field, that, uh, you know, there's it's still, you know, it's still an issue that you're grappling with. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think you can understate the impact that COVID had on on well everybody. You know, not yeah. just corrections, not just prisons, but like all of us in our personal lives. I mean, it, it's certainly been a been a trying time and I think for us as an agency it was you know particularly trying uh, as you know this this pandemic kind of made its way to us and you could you could see the train coming down the tracks so to speak um, you know but but I would also say that um, yeah I don't think I've ever encountered anything more professionally difficult um, but I've also you know, never encountered something that made me prouder to work with the people I work with. And, and I think, you know, for us, uh, we had the benefit of a little bit of time before COVID made its way into our system. But, um, you know, I, I, the one thing that, that we, we had resolved as a leadership team that, you know, we all kind of adhered to that same mantra that times of crisis don't build character, they reveal it. And, you know, in the run up, to COVID, we, we really worked hard on a philosophical shift for our agency where we were really trying to transition from an agency that, you know, that was viewed or perceived as being more punitive by nature and redefining how we define success as an agency by, by really turning our attention to the people in our care and custody or under our supervision. How are we positioning them to be successful and, and, and trying to have that different conversation about public safety to move past this old mantra that, you know, 
public safety is somehow a function of how quickly we can apprehend people who do wrong and really focus sure. on, on the aspect of, no, 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 this, like, we are safer when the people who've been involved in our system can contribute and be successful members of society. So, you know, you have this in the backdrop of a pandemic coming your way. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the dates March 12th and March 13th are always going to stick in my mind because, you know, that's, they're tied to our incident command structure. And, and on, on, you know, on March 13th is when we, we moved from that planning phase to the prevention phase. That's when we had our first uh, diagnosed case in Idaho. And, and our mantra throughout that was that if it mattered on March 12th, it still mattered on March 13th. And, and that that was going to be an opportunity for us to show people what we value. And what we valued were opportunities that we could provide our population to change. It, you know, we valued connections with family. We valued education. We valued rehabilitative programs. And so we knew that those things couldn't continue in the status quo, and it was really hard for our staff. Uh, but we also knew that not providing those opportunities are simply kind of hunkering down and hoping that it would pass, you know, mm -hmm. two more weeks, two more weeks. Like we knew from the outset that wasn't going to be the case. I mean, we had talked at the very beginning that we were going to be in this for at least 24 months. And so we took the long view. We knew that we had to try to figure out ways to allow the important work to continue. Uh, and I'm just, I'm incredibly proud of, of you know, what uh, the effort that our staff put in to, to doing that uh, and, and allowing those opportunities to continue. I'm also really damn proud of our population and the way they responded uh, because, you know, they had, uh, you know, they had a lot of opportunities to, uh, you know, to try to do the wrong things, to try to, to try to make political statements or to try to do that stuff. And, and I, I just could not have been prouder of the way they responded and the way that they put their shoulder into it as well to, to do the things necessary to try to protect the health and safety of everybody. So uh, we, we learned a lot. Um, we learned a lot about ourselves. <laughs> we learned a lot about, uh, about COVID-19. Um, but, but I also think uh, we, we learned some things and, and we're able to make some changes that are going to you know, leave a lasting legacy for our agency and, and fundamentally change the way we deliver programs and services in our facilities. Thank you. Um, yeah, so do you feel like, or um, do you feel like you're kind of more or less in a position where, you know, programs are being reintroduced yeah. and things like that? Or are you guys kind of still... Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think I, I get where you're going. And, cautious. And we are. We're cautious, and yeah. and and we have to be. And I think what what makes it more challenging, just candidly, is, you know, you look at, you know, you look at community mindsets and and the way the public responds to COVID, and and we're very much at a phase in this deal where, you know, people have to take some individual responsibility right. for taking measures to protect themselves. And, and that, I think that makes sense and it resonates. The problem is I don't have anybody living with me by choice. Right. Like they're in a custodial setting. And, and I think, you know, what we're really careful to try to safeguard against is when that mindset of, well, we, we just can stop implementing measures to try to, to try to protect people. Like, well, we can't because we have a different relationship like this the, we aren't a regular employer <laughs> you know we we have a different responsibility when you come to work for the idaho department of correction and and that's you know that's something that we have to be particularly vigilant about you know in leadership positions to make sure our staff understand that you know we still like the obligation to provide for the health and safety of the people uh who quite literally have been deprived of their liberty demands more and, and it's not, you know, we, we, we owe a, a more thoughtful conversation than, well, I don't have to wear a mask when I go to the grocery store. And it's like, right. well, you're choosing to go in that grocery store. So, you know, it's, it's really trying to separate the politics and the divisiveness of it and focus on what our core responsibility is. And that's to the health and safety of not just the people who live in our correctional facilities, but the people who work there too. So, 
you know, what we have been able to do over time, though, is, is really try to shift away from a subjective criteria and put objective measurements in place. So, sure. you know, we have a framework in place where our staff know when transmission levels hit this amount, it's going to trigger these sets of policies and practices that we implement uh, to try to uh, either expand or contract our COVID uh, prevention measures. And so, you know, it, it's ongoing. Um, I, I think we continue to learn more and we continue to get better at it. Uh, but, it, you know, it's not something where I see us just, you know, hanging that mission accomplished banner tomorrow. I don't think, I don't think there's, yeah, many areas of society that are doing that. But, yeah, I mean, um, that's uh, that's actually super enlightening, yeah, because you you realize that there's no there's not really any you know um, institution or workplace that's going to go a hundred percent back to the way things were mm -hmm. pre COVID. You know, at the very least, there's you know things that uh, w new ways that you're going to think about you know implementing things or things yeah. like that before you you know now. Um, in a, you know, in a post-COVID world. And so I think, uh, yeah, that's super enlightening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, we'll switch gears, you know, a little more. Uh, uh, we'll kind of go back and forth between uh, fun stuff, right? And because um, I was going to ask you, uh, you know, is there an aspect of IDOC that you're particularly proud of? Um, just like, you know. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, you know, our, our success and failure hinges on the human capital that we have. It's it's our people, and and I think, you know, the uh, probably the thing I'm I'm proudest of the most is just it's it's hard to describe, but there's just something inherent about the people who choose to undertake this important work that is, it's just really inspiring, mm -hmm. and. You know, uh, Chad can attest to it. I mean, we will, you know, we can, we can turn small problems into huge problems in a hurry. And, and there's a lot of, you know, passionate feelings about, about things. But when it matters, you know, when, uh, when, when the outcomes are the highest, you know, our, our folks come together. And they come together in ways that I just don't think you find in a lot of places. So I'm incredibly proud of the people, but I'm also, I'm really proud of, of the leadership that we have at the agency and, and the, the mindset of, you know, just how creative our division leaders are and how creative our facility heads are in, in you know, realizing, and I think this is something that is really hard in corrections because by nature we're incrementalists, you know, we've, we're generally resistant to change. We, you know, like it's, we're paramilitary driven, you know, hierarchy. And so a lot of, it's really hard for, you know, an agency like that to try to be nimble, to try to, to try to be responsive. And, and what I've, I've really appreciated from the people that that are around me is uh, like they just appreciate that you can't solve a problem with the same level of thinking that created it and and so I, like we've been able to approach issues that have plagued our agency for a long time from different perspectives and really make some movement we've been able to convince policymakers to invest differently and focus more resources in the community to to you know, help people on our on our caseload or people who are heading to us be more successful and, and try to resource those issues appropriately and so we, we've I'm just incredibly proud of of the people whose creativity and and drive have helped to make a lot of those things happen. And you just told me uh, when we were when we were discussing uh, the program for tonight that there was a board that you were just appointed to. Oh yeah. I was yeah. going to have you say more about that too. Just oh, I wanted yeah. to ask you that outside of yeah, you know how boards go. It's yeah. uh, a really prestigious opportunity for me to spend more time not getting paid for stuff, and right. it's super exciting. Uh, no, but it is that it's actually the group that I used to work for. Uh, uh, they're no, they no longer go by ASCA now. They're oh, it's the, the same, yeah, okay, same group, okay. and and. Uh, you know, went from being staff of the association to being a member, and then uh, this year was elected to the board and executive committee uh, of the association. And, and again, it's just such a, 
um, it, it really is uh, an exciting opportunity to, you know, to sit around the table with people that, that are all going through facing some similar challenges, but it's such a great opportunity to learn and uh, both from success and failure of other systems. And so, uh, yeah, it, I'll be uh, two years uh, okay, cool. uh, of service for that aspect. Thank you, yeah. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, okay, so as talked about, you know, kind of what aspect you're particularly proud of, but um, what aspects of IDOC uh, would you like to see improve and, you know, how, are, how do you feel like you guys are working toward? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I mentioned before the, the, the importance of the human capital, uh, the, the staff who, who make everything there happen. And, you know, certainly I think there are a lot of ways uh, that, you know, I mean, we're in a staffing crisis, you know, looking at, at the, the volume of improvements we've gone through as an agency to try to improve, you know, the recruitment, the retention, those aspects. And that's one that I think, uh, you know, we continue to have a lot of work to do on that front, but uh, also very happy with, with the progress that we've made in a really short amount of time. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, people, people will come to the work for a lot of different reasons. And, and you know, like if, if I, you know, they, they come to the work for whatever reason, like why I hope they stay is because they find meaning in it. They see an opportunity to, to affect people's lives in a positive way. And, and I think where, where we're looking for continual ways to improve that is, is drawing people to the agency for that reason, to, to move more towards mission-based hiring, uh, but also making sure from a cultural standpoint uh, that we are, in fact, you know, getting after those folks who aren't bought in to that particular mission and, and helping them, you know, find satisfaction in a career outside of the Idaho Department of Corrections. And so, you know, that's, that's one area where I think, you know, the Idaho Department of Corrections is a big ship. We have almost, well, after this last year, it'll be over 2,100 staff now. And, and, you know, but I think you know, for us to be successful and for us to continue to try to move the needle for public safety, we got to make sure that, that as a culture, we have a culture that values the success of the people who are entrusted to our care and custody or under our supervision. And, and that's one area where I think, you know, we need to continue to try to make progress. Is there a program within, uh, within uh, the agency Within IDOC, that um, you guys, uh, that you uh, in particular have felt has uh, benefited the men and women who incarcerated most, just you know, as far as uh, you know, programs that are available to them yeah. or reentry programs, just whatever it might be. Yeah, I, I think all of them to some degree. But uh -huh. you know, when when you, you know, we we've got. You know, we have, we have five core programs that are all cognitive based and, and you know, all the research will tell you it works. And, and when you have somebody in our system standing up in front of a judge, they'll tell the judge of the best programs they've ever had in the world, right? But like when you talk to people who have rounded the corner, when you've talked to people who have been able to make changes in their life, you know, programs work and I'm not saying they don't I mean, we've got a we've got volumes of research that prove that they do move the needle but when you talk to people you know they're pointing to an interaction with a staff member they're pointing to a human connection that they made with somebody else that helped them view the world differently that helped them see things in a different light and and or helped get them to a place where they were ready for change you know because that that I think is, you know, so it, it doesn't, I mean, we, like when, when folks are going through programs, you tell them fake it till you make it, right? Like, I mean, if, you know, if you may not buy what we're selling, but if the worst thing that happens is you stayed sober one more day, well then hell, that's okay, you know? So, you know, you, but I, like they all work and, and it's just like my struggle and what, I, I got asked one time if there was, you know, if, if I 
if, if I could have one wish or, or I can't remember the specific question, but my response was like my, I've yet to find that one intervention that works for everybody. And, and that's why we have so many different opportunities and we're constantly trying to do more because it could be as simple as somebody getting their GED. It could be as simple as somebody taking a Microsoft Office class and getting a certificate and having that be the first time in their life that they accomplished something or felt like they accomplished something. It can be a dog handling program. It can be, you know, crocheting. It can be volunteering and doing community service for a particular aspect. Like all of those things have therapeutic value. And so, you know, like it, it's, it, like I'd love to say like, well, our five core programs, man, we are changing lives left and right and they're the best thing that ever happened. They're a part of it. They're, you know, it's important to have those programmatic aspects, but there's so much to that experience where I think if you can put people in a position to make decisions, allow them to feel the rewards or consequences of the decisions they make mm -hmm. and learn from that, like that's how you're affecting change when people are incarcerated. Thank you. All right. And so, you know, speaking of programs and reentry uh, um, and providing them with tools and everything, what do you think the, the biggest challenges facing men and women who are reentering society are in, in 2022? Yeah, I'm going to go back and amend an earlier answer. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, going on, on the things that we need to improve on, and, and uh, you know, I know it's one of, it's one of Chad's highest priorities. It, you know, there, there's this irony that is part of corrections, right? And, and it, it's a relic of an old philosophy that says if we just make prisons hard, people won't want to come back. And so we did that for a long time. We made prisons really hard. But, like, when you, like, I think we can all agree, and I'm not breaking news here, like, we didn't change people, we made them worse. And, you know, a lot of systems are still writing checks for those failed policies. So, but the reason why we made people worse is if you think about why somebody comes to prison, generally, it relates to them making a bad decision. And when you look at what a hard prison environment is, we're putting them in, a, in an environment where they get to make one decision. We tell them when to get up, when to go to bed. We tell them when chow is. We tell them what they're eating. You know, we do their laundry. We deliver mail to them. We do all those things, and we basically give them one choice, and that's whether or not they comply. And, you know, to, to my last point about, like, that's not learning. That's a lesson in compliance. But at some point, 97% of them are going to walk out that gate, and they're going to be in one of our communities. And it's like... Nobody's going to be there to tell them the right decision to make. Nobody's going to be there to tell them to comply. They're going to have to do that on their own. And so I really do think historically we have missed opportunities to help develop that decision making, to help them, you know, choose their own adventure and correction, so to speak, by allowing them to feel the rewards or consequences of meaningful decisions that they get to make. You know, if I'm taking steps to better my life, if I'm signing up for classes and I'm taking programs and I'm volunteering and I'm working and I'm doing all these things, why am I not living in a place that gives me a lot more privileges or is a hell of a lot nicer than the people who are just bunk surfing and not getting in trouble, you know? So that's on us and that's, you know, an area where we're continuing to try to improve to make sure that, that you know, we're getting a better measuring stick for real decision making because that's real risk. Uh, more so than the absence of getting in trouble. So on that aspect, I think like just being mindful of when you look at reentry, you just ha you can't ignore how different the world they're, co they're reentering is compared to the world that they just lived. Great. And, you know, I had an opportunity um, with a, a gentleman who created a program called Day One where he's he, he's a mentor and he picks up his mentees and he helps them get situated on that first day out and he took me with him and it was just one of the most uh, one of the most profound experiences I've ever had because on a human level you know we went and picked up a guy named Bob who he'd been down with us for 20 years and and Bob was lucky Bob had a retirement waiting for him when he got out he had some resources you know he, he had social security so he, you know Bob wasn't a hard case per se but you go 
like at a human level, you are watching another human being experience a world they don't know anymore. And it's really hard to watch. Things from getting emotional, from seeing a tree because you haven't seen one in so long, from you know, asking them like, what are you looking forward to? And, and the response being to be able to run in a straight line. And you're just like, man. Things like it, we take, It's yeah. so impactful to, to hear those things, but that's what he's known. You know, for 20 years, but then, you know, I, I, I tried explaining it to my wife that you know, personally it was a punch to the heart, but professionally it's a slap to the face, because then we walk into a thrift store to get him some clothes, and he had no idea what size clothes he wore. Mm -hmm. What he knew was that he wore double XL prison scrubs, and so we're trying to eyeball him, going, oh, I think you're a 36. We'll go find some stuff, and it's like, you know. This is a guy that has resources that, you know, was fairly well educated, that, you know, made a mistake a long time ago, and, and, and it should not have been that hard for him, and, and he's a lucky one. And so, I, you know, whether you're down 20 years or you're down, I, I mean, hell, if you went to prison two years ago and you came out now, what does that look like? Like the, it's a very different place. We access services differently. So I, I think the biggest challenge is helping, helping make that transition. You know, the things we control from, a, from a, a, an in-custody standpoint is, you know, we've got work to do to make that transition more seamless, whether it's exposing them to technology, exposing them to things, making that baked into everyday life, not a program, but like as part of the, uh, of how they access services or how they live in our correctional facilities. Like that's the first thing we can do and we're trying to do to minimize the impact. But the second part of that is, you know, uh, I mean, it's basic risk principles. You know, need oftentimes equates to risk. Sure. And, and it's, it's being thoughtful and intentional about understanding where somebody's needs are and, and putting them in connection with resources to help meet those needs. And, you know, for a long time as an agency, I think we focused a lot on the programmatic aspect of, well, somebody's in here for substance use disorder, my God, we got to get them some treatment. And, and, and you know, where we're evolving and, and where we're trying to leverage community partners is being a little more thoughtful going like what's another dose of treatment going to do when that guy doesn't know where he's sleeping the night or he doesn't know where his next meal's coming from or he doesn't know how he's going to get across town you know tomorrow to be where he needs to be by a certain time like those things matter and so by putting a higher emphasis on the supportive services not just the programmatic and the therapeutic aspects uh, I, I think that I think those are significant challenges in our community and and I would tell you uh, we have work to do, but we damn sure don't own that space by ourselves. That's where we need community partners. That's where we need other resources brought to bear. Because uh, you know, I, I just selfishly, I've I've had conversations in in various counties where you know some people want to think that crime in their community is the responsibility of the state of Idaho, and particularly the Idaho Department of Correction. It's like, yeah, it's not. You know, like we all have some skin in the game here, and so you know, how those communities receive people who are returning to them matters. You know, can we, we're gonna bring them in, we're gonna wrap services around them, or are we just gonna try to pretend they don't exist and force them to the outskirts and wait for something bad to happen? So, you know, there's so much work to be done on the, on the, the reentry front, but I also think that we've never paid more attention to it than we have the last couple of years. Right. You know, the legislature has funded some significant investments in community supervision, but things that look like meaningful resources to help people uh, try to put their lives on a different trajectory. So, you know, I, I still think it's, it's the future. I think it's where we have to continue to look to invest because it's where we have the most impact, not like, like uh, it's, is what I love about this work and what I think is the most exciting part about what my staff get to do every day is for a lot of actors in the criminal justice system, you know, their involvement with the people in our system are finite from that arresting officer to a prosecutor to a judge to a parole commissioner. But like nobody, for people who are sent to prison, nobody's going to spend more time and have a greater influence with them than my correctional officers. But think about our probation and parole officers who have such a unique opportunity to get to know their caseload and 
apply interventions when warranted to try to help people go about their life differently, to be able to try to put them on a different path or a different trajectory, or in some cases to put handcuffs on them and get them out of the community before they commit another crime. Great. And so like, it's not just a, like, in the broader sense, it's a public safety aspect, but the more we focus on reentry and the more we focus services upstream, we are meaningfully impacting crime in our communities. And, and I think that's awful damn exciting for our folks to be able to play a role in that. Yeah. Actually, I, uh, similar thoughts here. I feel like, you know, there is more of an emphasis these days on it, but I always wondered if it was just, you know, the fact that I pay attention to it more, you know, these days with what, with what we do here. But, uh, but yeah, that's really great to hear. And I think, yeah, we've heard similar things from other guests. And so do you have, um, do you have, uh, you know, a, uh, any folks you know who you who've been in the system or were in the system that um, that you you know still talk to once in a while on a yeah. regular basis yeah yeah we actually quite a few uh, you know and, and I think part of that too it was important for us as we were trying to figure out you know who we wanted to be and how we could get better was you know uh, to stop sitting in our third floor conference room trying to end, you know trying to pretend that we had all the answers. And so we've, we've been pretty intentional about reaching out to people with lived experience in our system, to family members of people with lived experience, and, and trying to learn how we can be better at the work that we do. Uh, and, and their insight has been, has been pretty amazing. We, we created a, a Citizens Advisory Council that, okay. you know, it kind of formalizes that, but there's a lot more informally that goes on of, you know, like certainly, when you're working with community partners in the space, a lot of those folks, you know, there are a lot of people that have, you know, prior experience with our system. And so we get a lot, you know, from some formal channels, but we also get a lot anecdotally and on the side. And, and sure. uh, we've, we've uh, you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but we've created an environment where we're pretty accessible. So people have not been shy about reaching out uh, when they have something we, they think we need to hear. So. Yeah, that's exactly what I was just going to ask you. If it was more of a, if you had a, a formalized committee of some sort, or if it was, or if it's more anecdotal. And so, how um, is that a committee that meets, um, you know, uh, just for for specific projects or? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. It, it. So of course, like most things. Um, we stood it up right before COVID hit. Right. <laughs> so, so our first meeting got canceled and then we went virtual from that point on. And, and, you know, I think where we've really tried, like there were some good opportunities though through COVID where, you know, there were people who were part of that process that wanted to plug in and wanted to help. And so, you know, there were a lot of really cool activities that they helped facilitate. And, and what we've tried to do is, I mean, there, there are plenty of ways to, you know, express your displeasure with us as an agency, you know, th that this really needs to be about how can we improve services for people who are coming back home. And, and, and so they've been, you know, the group's been fantastic at trying to be really strategic in how they think, like not using it as a, as a, a forum to air a particular grievance, but like if, if we can affect outcomes for big segments of the population, well then let's plug in and let's focus on those things. And so um, they've, they've been uh, provided a lot of help in, in troubleshooting issues from, you know, video visitation to, you know, email to other ways that family members can communicate with their loved ones, you know, uh, and, and they've also put a lot of time and effort into, into reentry type projects. Do you feel like when you are, um you know, receiving uh, receiving feedback and uh, and uh, and soliciting advice from from a group like this that you have a good balance of men and women who mm -hmm. are able, who are reflecting on their experiences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I, you know, it's um, I I mean, when you boil down what we do, and you like, if you just take a step back. Like it, I wish more people could have meaningful experience with our system. Not like I don't want more people coming to prison. Sure. Let me be clear. I want more tours. I want more people to see the work up close. I want 
people to get their butts in our facilities and, and take a look at what we're doing because I know, I know what they're gonna find are staff that care a lot about the work. They're gonna find people working really damn hard to turn their lives around and they're gonna find some things that we're doing wrong. And that's okay, like that's part of this, part of having that discussion with people with lived experience, male and female, is to try to find those things. Because if we, you know, like Chad probably gets tired of hearing me say it, but like our, our you know, wearing a badge doesn't make us right. You know, our responsibility is to get it right, not be right. And that means we have to be open to areas where we're not, where we've got room for improvement, where we need to get better. And, and that's what, what's been so cool about the people who've chosen to engage, in, you know, not just on the Citizens Advisory Council, but Chad's got a group of folks that reach out to him quite a bit. You know, I've got some folks that reach out to me. Uh, the, all the members of my leadership team have that to a certain extent, where you've got your informal advisors as well is you know they're you know they're doing it in a way that's productive they're doing it in a way to try to help improve outcomes and and they're doing it because they know we're open to it because they know we're going to hear them and and we don't always agree we don't always you know what I think has also been equally beneficial in uh, especially getting folks who have that lived experience back out into our institutions as they see it from a different side you know we've had a couple of them say like Man, was I like that? You're like, yeah, kind of. You dropped a lot of paper on us, dude. You know, but you get, you know, the, like there's a shared perspective now where I think, you know, we've got a lot of these folks that are passionate about the work that now have a better understanding of where we're coming from and what our responsibilities are, and that, yeah, it seems mean, but we also have to keep everybody safe, you know, and and so, you know, that that it's a two-way street, and it's been a, a really positive thing for us, and and one that I think is going to continue to grow. Just as far as reentry programs and everything, since I since I asked you about men and women on the advisory council, um, that reentry programs are are uh, kind of equally available for for men and women as far as resources and everything. Or do you think there's any improvement no, on, e on either side? Yeah, I, that I could be. I think what you what you're going to find nationally in corrections, and and it's true here in Idaho, is that. In most correctional systems, you're looking at, you know, eight to twelve percent of the population is female, right? And uh, which tells you what the other, what the remainder of that population is. And so, like, one of the challenges that we've had is, in the best case scenario, you have policies that are gender neutral, but most of the time, you have a lot of policies that were written for men whether it's disciplinary, whether it's classification, whether it's property. You have a lot of things that were written for men that were like, well, it'll work for the females too. And so we've got a lot of work going on right now. We're in the middle of doing uh, GRIPA assessments, gender responsive practices. And, and um, so we've got a lot of work on, on uh, gender responsive practices going on right now, not just in facilities, but out in the community as well. Uh, that I think is going to be pretty helpful to inform kind of how we how we better tailor those things. We've already broken out some stuff. Like we've, you know, we're, we're we've looked at 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 how we break apart and, and decipher risk uh, through our LSIR. Like we're we're using different cutoffs for females than we are for males because the research supports it. So, yeah, we've already found some ways that we can break those apart. But I think on average, you know, we're we're going to be uncovering a lot of policies that are at best gender neutral, but in most cases are written specifically for men, and, and we're committed to change those. That's the reason I ask is because that's just, you know, um, what we've definitely found, you know, here with researching the site when it was when it was in operation, you know, definitely, a, you know, a much smaller percentage, 200, um, uh, 217 out of 13,000, you know, yep. people who were incarcerated here. And so when a, uh, yeah, when a policy was written, it was applied to, applied similarly to the women. And if it didn't apply, there just wasn't a policy, you yeah. know, there just wasn't a policy for, yeah. for them. And, uh, and it meant fewer programs available. And yeah, and I, and, I think and we're just a hell of a lot smarter now. Right. I mean, we understand that their pathways to prison are different than men. There's a high incidence of victimization. There's a high incidence of trauma. There's, you know, there are a lot of, 
there are a lot of contributing factors that require different interventions. And so, you know, we've been doing the, the ACES survey for um, all, all the females entering RDU in our system, and, you know, it's off the charts compared to the community average, how many of them have experienced trauma. And it's like, well, if our policies aren't responsive to that, you know, then, you know, we're not only are we not creating an environment where, where that trauma can be processed and they can heal, we're re-traumatizing them just right. by doing our jobs as spelled out by policy in certain aspects. So I, I think, you know, just from a practical standpoint, we're a lot smarter about this now than we've ever been. And now it's a matter of applying that new knowledge and what the research tells us with, you know, decades of policy and practice that we have to try to change. Makes sense. Okay. Um, so this question uh, kind of goes back to the um, the COVID response mm -hmm. uh, a little bit, and so they're asking: During COVID, was any prisoner uh, prison or reentry program hit especially hard? Uh, any location or yeah. yeah or center? You know, I'm trying to think of. You know, we were, uh, I mean, yeah, no, no loss of life is acceptable, and, but I, I think we were incredibly fortunate to not have the incidence of severe illness the way most correctional systems did. Sure. And so, you know, what, uh, but we did have, uh, we had, uh, I think, a total of seven residents who, who died from, from COVID. Um, but I don't, I, I think, you know, I, I think we were, we were really fortunate to not have, I mean, it, the, the one thing I would tell you is that we went, you know, we had a lot of time to plan, you know, from when we stood up our response to when we first got COVID in our system. And um, I, I, I've just never experienced anything like that. I mean, we sat there, we got our first COVID positive case at Idaho State Correctional Center and, and you know, we're looking at a, at a heat map a couple days later and you've got one positive case and we were on modified restricted status. So this wasn't open movement. Like we were being careful, all that stuff. And next thing you know, you know, you're looking and you're like, basically all but one unit's been touched. You know, just sure. from all the, you know, the, the movement stuff like that. And, and we'd never encountered anything that spread like that, that, that had the virility of it. And so it was just, uh, you know, every facility got hit. No facility was spared. Um, but I think we were really, really fortunate to not have, you know, the, the severe uh, catastrophic outcomes that a lot of other systems did. And it really was a credit to our facility staff and our incident command team for getting the right practices in play to try to minimize spread as best as possible. And it also, uh, it, part of it too was probably the least comfortable aspect of it all was, um, you know, knowing we were gonna find a lot of cases that were asymptomatic and knowing how people would respond and, you know, come after us for all the positive cases. But frankly, testing was, what it felt like the only tool we had available to help us at least detect and isolate and minimize spread. Uh, and so we tested like it was going out of style. And sure. I mean, we did mass testing and, and, and we continued to do testing, which meant we got a whole bunch of asymptomatic positives, but it at least helped us mitigate spread to a point where, you know, we were able to, to largely keep our vulnerable populations unaffected by it uh, in any sort of significant way. And, so, uh, you know, I, I, as tough as it was uh, and as tragic as it was, I think we were still fortunate to be spared some worse outcomes. I think the biggest program that, that was affected by it, and it was affected everywhere, was visiting. Sure. I think that was the hardest aspect of, you know, having family members, you know, that, you know, not, not getting able to see and hug and, and, and love on their loved ones like that. that I think that was the hardest part, and there's just not a there's not a substitute through video visitation and things like that, you know, for for certain connections. So I, I think that was the one that that hurt the most for a lot of people, and that was system wide. Everybody got hit by that. Thank you. 
Yeah, there's some, some great questions in here. Um, how would you respond to those who believe, and this is a question we actually get asked here too, um, how would you respond to those who believe prison should return to a harsher penal system? Um, like, you know, maybe saying, uh, um, maybe people who come here and say, and see the, you know, yeah. the harsh uh, stone walls and everything and feel like this it's, or it should be returned to. Yeah. Uh, Man, I, I, it is, yeah, not surprisingly, I get that a lot. And I, I would just tell you, you know, we have, we, we create so many problems when we make value judgments about other people, right? And it's really easy to do in this work. You know, you, you define people by what they did. You know, he's a druggie, he's a this, she's a that. And and you make, you know, it allows you to dehumanize and make the decisions that you make about them. But what I've, what I've continued to learn, and I don't think anybody's going to convince me otherwise, the decisions we make as a system reflect who we are, not the people who are sentenced to our care and custody. And so, you know, I think those folks that, that view prison or view this experience as an opportunity to punish rather than to transform, I think that speaks more to their values than, or who they are, than it does the, the people who have already been punished by having their liberty deprived. And this um, kind of flows in a little bit. What uh, would you say is the most difficult aspect of your job, the most difficult aspect? Uh, there's, there's really no one thing, and, and it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I think the, you know, the, the difficult things, like I've had so many, I've had so many experiences that, you know, are, are never going to leave me. Like, I'm going to think about them as long as I live, and, and, you know, some of those are, are, you know, like like when, when staff get hurt and you go visit somebody in the hospital, uh, you know, or, you know, we had a, a young man in our custody, you know, who, who took his, he took his own life and I went and met with his parents and like the, you know, the, the, the entirety of the time I'm sitting there meeting with them, all I'm thinking of, like, he should have never been in our system, you know, and, and, and feeling responsible you know for for that young man's death and and you know that's but that's part of the job you know that comes with the territory it's you know getting a a phone call that that i had you know a a, a po had to discharge their weapon they you know, got in the gunfight and you know like it's that kind of stuff that you know is it's the stuff that keeps you up at night but it's it's also you know the stuff that really serves as as motivation to to try to to try to get better at this, to try to be more successful at affecting outcomes, and uh, and it, it's just a good reminder that you know the stakes are pretty damn high, and but also that's you know that's yeah like I, like I say it, it it's one of those things where I just you know I can't imagine having a greater personal or professional honor than being in the job I have right now, but you know, that, that weight you carry for some, you know, for the stakes that really do matter, like that's, you know, that's the cost you pay to be allowed to have that opportunity. Yeah, I think, uh, it's, you know, it's greatly benefited, you know, me and, and our, our staff here to be able to, to interact and speak more with, uh, with your team. And just because I think it's, uh, it's so, you know, beneficial to know that, you know, every, you know, top down, it's, uh, you know, there's, you know, there's human thought and feeling that are, you know, that are, that are processing these things. And so, yeah. um, and I, gonna, I think, you know, to that point, though, like the, the, like, the, you know, this question and the one you asked before, are very much related from a certain standpoint, because I think, you know, Chad would tell you too, like, you put your trust in people, you believe in people, and sometimes they're gonna let you down. 
you know, it's, it's when you see that person who's at this facility and they're doing everything right and you just believe so strongly that they're going to make it and then they don't, you know, it hurts, you know, but, you know, the answer isn't to not believe that about somebody else. You know, the answer is like, all right, well, let's, let's keep doing what we're doing. Let's keep trying to figure out ways that we can help people be more successful. And, and it's the same thing on the staff front where, you know, folks that we put in positions of trust that, that you know and you love and you've just had a relationship for years, they'll do things, you know, that you just go, man, I, I can't explain it. But it doesn't mean you stop trusting and, and nurturing and trying to develop, you know, other people who are coming up behind them. And so that, it's just, th those are the, yeah, that's, those are the hard parts. But I, I, don't, I don't think you get to be involved in work that matters without having hard parts. Great. This question is, uh, how are in-facility consequences or punishments for uh, folks who are already, you know, incarcerated? Uh, determined. Could you speak about that process mm -hmm. just briefly? Yeah, yeah. We have a. I don't know if I can speak about it briefly. I know that's why I was like, I, that's I a can. big, that's a big one. So, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. You you really have, you know, you, you really have, um, you know, we have a, we have a, a disciplinary policy. You know, we have all the different infractions people can commit. We have a, we have. A, you know, we assign weighted value to them, you know, a class A, a class B, a class C. You know, we, we try to create informal sanctions, you know, that sort of stuff. But, you know, part of it, and, and I, you know, I do think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of research behind, you know, swift and certain, making sure people understand their consequences, making sure they know what they are up front, and then when they do something to deserve them, they experience those in a timely and fair manner. Um, and so that's really kind of the basis for our disciplinary code. Um, what, I, what I can tell you, though, is over time, uh, especially, you know, the last five to ten years, we've tried to be a little more thoughtful about, you know, about how we implement that, that disciplinary policy, for example. And this might be a shock to some people, but on, the rare, on rare occasions, drugs can, in fact, be smuggled into our facilities. And, you know, so we have somebody who tests positive, uh, you know, for, for drugs, you know, our, our traditional response was like, well, we're going to, you know, we'll put them in restrictive housing for 30 days. And it's like, well, nobody's, you know, nobody's kicking and screaming to not go to restrictive housing. Like they'll do their time and they'll do 30 days on their head and they'll be right back out doing what they were doing before. And so trying to be more thoughtful, similar to we would in the community and go, okay, we, we know we have a dirty UA here. We know they're using drugs. Like, what are we doing about that? Like, what are we doing? Are, are, we, are we providing any treatment? Are we providing opportunities for them to, to make different decisions in the future, uh, short of the punishment aspect? And so, you know, what we've really tried to do is try to pair, you know, a, a consequence with an actual intervention when it's warranted uh, to try to get people, to try to actually do something about the root cause of what got them in trouble to begin with. Uh, and that's a, that's a long process, uh, but, uh, you know, one, I think, is we, become, uh, you know, more of who we want to be and the types of opportunities we provide. I think, I think those consequences are going to have more meaning for people when you give them something they can lose, when they have the ability to earn rights and privileges and experiences that they can then have taken away from them when they do the wrong things. I think that's, you know, that's part of a process that's going to be better facilitated when we create an environment in prison that's a little more normal. Thank you. All right, and then I think, because uh, this is a, a great one to end on, uh, what is one thing that you wish the general public understood about the system and incarceration that they uh, many don't? Yeah, I, I just, I think, I, I, you know, people's opinions are based on their perspective, and that perspective a lot of times comes from what they read or what they see on TV or you know, how they consume information. It could be movies, it could be uh, a lot of different things, and, and that's just grossly inaccurate. You know, I, I, you know it's, it's undoubtable that, you know, we have some bad people in prison, we have some dangerous people in prison, um, but the vast majority of people in prison are people 
that are like us, that made mistakes, that are trying really hard to do something about that. And, you know, like, like our, our job is to, you know, to kind of manage the knucklehead, so to speak, but like we see it, like our problems come from a really small percentage of the population. And then we've got this bigger group that are really trying to do the right things. In the same way, you know, like we have, you know, I, I, I did a podcast in, uh, out at one of our facilities and, and one of the residents there was asking me about, you know, you know about what I would say to the, the residents when we have a, a staff member who does the wrong things and, you know, how, do, how are they supposed to have confidence? And it's like, well, do we, like, do we really want to get in the game of allowing the actions of a small minority to define everybody? Like, because it feels like you're already in that game right now, you know, like maybe we can all take a step back and realize that, uh, you know, like where people are doing the wrong things, we need to step in and hold them accountable and do that stuff. But, but that applies equally to the people who work there as it does the people who live in our facilities as well. And so I'd go back to, I just, I wish people could see how much our staff care about their work and, and how much value they get out of helping other people be successful because that's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's inspiring to be around. And it's why I love getting out of bed every day and going to work for the Idaho Department of Correction. At the same time, it's equally inspiring to see people who have, in some cases, been dealt unimaginably, unimaginably bad hands and still looking for cards to play, still trying to figure out ways to get their life turned around, to try to avoid the mistakes that they've made in the past. And, and you know, that, like, I think those people are, are more the rule than they are the exception in prisons, sure. but you don't see that on TV. You don't see that when 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 uh, our industry and our vocation gets represented uh, in 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 movies or or the press. And and I, I can tell you, like when you, that's why I say I, I want people to experience it because when you do, you get it in spades. You understand it. Uh, you just, yeah, you, you can't uh, you can't continue to spend time around. Uh, not just the people who work in our facilities, but the people who live there too, and, and to come away with a, a different appreciation for the importance uh, and also, uh, you know, the stakes uh, in this work. And, you know, I, I you know, there, there's a, you know, there, I mean, one of the other things that I think is really, it, it's, it's hard not to take personal is because I know for certain segments of the population, like, like me and my work and my agency, you know, represent a lot of things that they believe are wrong with this country. They represent oppression. They represent, you know, a lot of other, like a system that is stacked up against them. And, and I don't think they're wrong, you know, like that's their perspective and I'm, I'm not gonna tell them they're wrong. But uh, like where, where I tend to disagree with with certain elements of, of the advocacy community around prisons is that I don't think the answer is to demonize corrections. I think the answer is to elevate it. It's to elevate the importance of, of this work because when you do, you know, you're not dealing with inmates in numbers. People are appreciating that you're dealing with human beings. And, and you know, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. But, but I don't think we get there until we, get past these perceptions that get fueled by different narratives and different political agendas and all that crap. Like, no, elevate the work. Make sure people understand, regardless of where you are in life, regardless of your past experiences, like this work is really damn important because it has the ability to drastically affect lots of people's lives uh, for positive or negative. And, and uh, I, I, yeah, I think a lot of what we experience is because of, you know, just uh, uh, a perspective that's informed by less than accurate sources. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, when, uh, so first of all, um, I'd like to tell you thank you. Thank you, Josh, for, uh, for joining us tonight and for, uh, for being so, you know, open and willing to answer questions and for, for giving us your time and, um, you know, Chad, um, 
and other folks on your team have either done one of these captivating conversations, uh, discussions with us, or, or have expressed interest in doing so, and it's, um, it's been you know, invaluable for, uh, um, for our audience and for the work that we do here. Uh, in addition, Chad's working with, uh, with our uh, um, community advisory uh, group that we put together for the reimagining of the of the site's interpretation and its uh, and the uh, re-envisioning of our visitor experience and what uh, we want them to get out of a visit here which includes uh, being able to access a bridge you know from this site's 101 years of operations to where we're at today. And uh, so I also want to thank you for, uh, for, your, um, for your agency's support in that and for being such a great partner. And we uh, really appreciate getting to know you guys and have you guys out here and talk to you. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um,